do seem to be affected by it. I think especially parents of young children, you know, kind of give a bit of a disclaimer to any of my friends with kids who are going to see it. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I have to say the thing that I wanted most to provoke in an audience after the play was finished was for them to keep talking about it, you know. It, it's such a strange thing to work on a play f for two or three or four years for an audience to sit there for an hour or two and then to come out and say, well, where are we having dinner, you know, and to actually um, embed something in their minds or their hearts that makes them not be able to just let go of it. Um, and also, you know, the loveliest thing I heard was from somebody who came and she said that was a play that made me turn to the stranger beside me and just want to talk to them about it. So, you know, that's what theatre is. It's, it's a communal experience where you are sitting next to strangers that you'll never see again probably. And if you can actually reach across and connect with them and talk to them, then, you know, I think that that's fantastic. So I suppose, you know, what I've wanted more than anything is for people as they walk down that long corridor of the Sydney Theatre Company or hang around in the bar afterwards is to argue what happens. And, and as I mentioned, there's um, a lot of ambiguity around it as in turn of the screw, you can view the story in, in multiple ways and it still makes sense. Um, and I, I took some friends last night and all the way home we were arguing, well they were arguing vociferously about what they thought happened and it was really different actually to what I think happened but holds water, you know. Um, so I think in some ways too it reflects the psyche of the viewer, which is true of any kind of art, you know, you, you view art through a very particular lens of your own experiences or your own um, beliefs. Um, but yeah, with this play it's really interesting and even in terms of the actors in the play, Helen who plays the mother can't bear to think that the worst happens to Laura. She, she thinks that she gets down and runs away and escapes once the lights come down. So um, yes, the, the responses have been really interesting. It is cathartic and also it forces you to actually kind of pick up these stones and turn them over and look at them from all angles and examine them and make yourself go, if this were me, what would I do, you know? Um, so there's something quite healthy, I think, for a, a, an artist of any kind to confront the things that they're afraid of, whether that's literally, as in the narrative, a child going missing, or more figuratively, um, you know, a fear of mental illness or a question about your own um, resilience, your mental resilience. Um, yeah, I, I think it sort of puts you in a position of having to look quite deeply inside yourself. And, um, and that is scary, but it, it's also quite thrilling in some ways. And, and you learn a lot about yourself in the process. Um, but I also think uh, you owe it to an audience to take them through that. I don't necessarily mean to end happily because the splinter doesn't end happily. But to follow through, to not just kind of leave them at a halfway point, you know, lost in the murk, but to take them all the way through a story. Two things that I loved about The Turn of the Screw. One was that, that ability to read it in vastly different ways. So I read it twice in quick succession and the first time I read it I thought, um, yes, those children are possessed and the governess is bravely marching in there to save them and then the second time I read it I thought she's bonkers these children are two innocent normal kids and she is just impugning them with all you know these dreadful assumptions and you know both of those interpretations hold water so I loved I loved that and I loved that it compelled you to go back and read it and look for clues and look for um, the truth of the story and still not really be able to find it. Um, and the other thing I loved, as I sort of talked about earlier, was the power of suggestion. So, so little is actually explicit in the turn of the screw. There's that whole thing about the children's relationship with those two ghosts, Quint and Miss Jessel. And there's kind of, oh, I guess, 
inferences that it's something sexual or something very perverse, but it's not explicitly stated exactly what it is, so your mind supplies the details. So one, I suppose it reflects back on you, which is really interesting. Um, and two, it, as I said, you know, I think that the way that we fill that, that void or fill that space um, is always going to be richer and, and more frightening than what a writer kind of cleanly lays out for us. So I love the restraint in turn of the screw. There's certainly no holding back on, you know, the vivid pictures that he paints. Um, and the detail and the psychological accuracy. But um, it's not, there's no blood and guts, there's no sex, you know, there's nothing that we can just kind of go, oh, okay, now I know, I can put it aside. You're always, it's always tugging at your sleeve and for that reason I think it's quite haunting and therefore so effective. So I, again, without, um, I don't think I consciously set out to mimic any of that in the splinter, but just because I had absorbed it and was so thrilled by it, um, I think that there are shades of that in the writing of The Splinter. I've had plays with people in masks and I've had plays with dolls in them, but I haven't ever worked with a puppeteer and certainly not where puppetry was a, a fundamental element of the production. Once I decided, and this was before I'd spoken to Alice, but once I had decided that Laura would be played by a puppet, the first question I asked myself was, well, how is she going to speak? And then the next, you know, the answer I came up with was that she doesn't speak, that she's mute. And that adds to the parent's frustration and the mystery that surrounds her. So there was a kind of nice um, call and response going on in my head about, how to solve problems and when we knew that we were going to ha obviously need puppeteers manipulating Laura the puppet um, then that provided the potential for one two five actors or puppeteers um, to either become characters or to create sort of atmosphere in, in, in various different ways and so what we have in what we came up with I suppose over the process of workshopping and rehearsing is that there are these two manipulators, we call them, and to begin with um, their job is very specifically to work the puppet, but um, you also kind of get a sense that they are the people that took Laura, whoever they are, and brought her back. And then at a certain point when the father doesn't believe that this child is his daughter, he starts to doubt that that's, it's really Laura, they physically take her place. So the puppet disappears and one of those girls becomes Laura. And the mother is kind of unfazed by the fact that she's been replaced by a completely different person and the father fixates on this. And then just as he starts to get used to that, the other actress takes her place. So there's this very fluid representation of her. Um, so we used them not just to, to manipulate the puppetry, but to, and, that, and that's why we cast actors too, not puppeteers. They happen to be very skillful with the puppetry, but it's most important that they're actors because they're playing roles. And that was um, something we, we kind of all agreed on from the beginning, that all the mechanics would be very exposed. So, you know, there's a fan that blows the curtain in and you can see that fan and um, there's somebody feeding gum leaves in front of the fan to get the effect of leaves being blown across the space and you see them there. Um, so there's no, and then there's a fog, a kind of rolling fog over the ground at the bottom and you see the machine. So there's no sort of hiding any of that. It's, it's not really very high tech. I mean, it's a beautiful um, production and you know, the sound is lovely and everything works really well, but there's no kind of hidden pyrotechnic. Um, personally, you know, I embrace the artificiality of theatre. I think once you, you, you can expose anything and you can keep, it's like a hall of mirrors. It was one thing we found, for example, when we were playing with, with the puppet, that it could be a manipulator working a child, 
or it could be um, a little girl playing with a doll or it could be a mother playing with her daughter. So even just that image of a, you know, a grown actress with a puppet, um, you could keep sort of flipping it over on itself and, and it meaning different things. Um, so I do love that about the theatre, that you, you have an image and you set parameters up around it and you say to an audience, this is what it means, and they go, okay, buy that. And then you can turn it over and they'll have to come with you. So I, I find that kind of a, a really exciting thing about the theatre, the, the playfulness of it and the um, communal make-believe.